but we're get, we are going to focus primarily on hair because of the fact that hair is found many times at the crime scene. We're going to go over the different structures of hair, different parts to it, like what parts are valuable for individual versus um, class characteristics, things like that of that nature. Okay, hair, of course, is found in all sorts of crime scenes. Um, it is not possible to individualize hair. So you cannot match a hair to a person. Okay, you can say it's consistent with that person's hair or inconsistent, but you can't match it. Okay, just by looking at it, just because you have blonde hair, curly hair, what have you, it may match, but it's not an individual characteristic. Now, sometimes you can get DNA from it, but you can't always get DNA from hair. It's very difficult, actually, to get DNA from the hair. Okay? However, it can still be um, circumstantial evidence to help link somebody or something to a crime. You can say it's consistent with the hair or inconsistent with the hair being found at the crime scene. So morphology is just a fancy word for shape or structure. And so hair is actually part of your skin. It's considered an appendage, which means something that's coming out from the skin. And it goes all the way from the bulb, and we're going to talk about the different phases of hair and stuff. I've got pictures in just a moment. It's going to go all the way from the bulb or the root of the hair to the, to the end of the hair follicle. Okay? And the shaft, which is like the, the bulk of the hair, has three parts. I do want you to know these three parts. That's the cuticle, the cortex, and the medulla. Okay. And so that's what you typically see whenever we look under the microscope later on today. We're going to be looking at the cuticle, the cortex, and the medulla. So that's like, a, the, like if you slice the hair in half lengthwise, those are the three parts that you'd be able to see. Okay, so, let me blow this up. I do want you to know the parts to the hair. <clears throat> and so if you remember when we talked about the skin, we had that dermal, the, there was the epidermis and the, derm, the dermal capillary. Well, that's similar here. So this is the, the capillary, which is the blood vessel, because your hair does require blood, you no know, nutrients. And so this is a very, very tiny blood vessel that goes and feeds the hair for if you have healthy hair. Then, of course, we have our papillary layer here. And then this is the, the bulb of the hair for the hair root. This would be the shaft. And, of course, the tip would be where, where it's been cut at. Oops. So let me move this on over. Here we go. And this is just a colored... Region, so you can see the bulb of the hair. The hair follicle itself is what is keeping it in place. And that's important later on because of the way the hair is removed. And if you remember when we talked about sexual assault, and remember I said that they had to rip the hair out. They can't cut the hairs whenever they take from the victim and the suspects to rip it out. So you'll, we'll find out the reason why for that in a moment. And this is the sebaceous gland. What is the sebaceous gland? Does anyone know what, what does it do? Oils. It's free oils. It's free oils. Okay, so we have the oils. We also have your sweat glands around the hair. And then we have the erector muscles, also called the erector pili, which is what causes your hair to stand up on end, which is important actually for you to help keep, regulate your body temperature. Okay, and so there's a little muscle on each of your hairs, and that's what, whenever it contracts, it causes your hairs to stand up. So now this is if we took the shaft of the hair and we took like a guillotine or something and, and chopped it in half lengthwise. You're going to see the three parts, you know, it's shaking right now from the air conditioning, the three parts that, that you're going to be able to visualize underneath the microscope. Okay, so the first one is this outermost region, and that's the cuticle. So similar to the, I know women who get their nails done, they talk about pushing the cuticles down. Your hair has the cuticle too, it's the outer, co the outer covering or the outer coating of the hair. And it's textured. And we'll talk about the different cuticle, cuticle patterns that there are. Because it depends upon the species. Or even different types of hair. There's, many times, there's this part that, it's a, usually a darker line. 
that runs through the middle, and that's called the medulla. So we're going to find out that the medulla sometimes is absent, sometimes it's present. It can be fragmented, um, and it can be uh, uh, continuous as well. And then all the other stuff, that's called the cortex. And inside the cortex, there may be these little pigments or these little black dots called ovoid bodies. But the, cor the cortex itself is the, for humans, it's the bulk of the hair itself. The cuticle is the outside, the cortex is on the inside, and the medulla, if it's there, is this middle portion. It is the cortex that gives the hair its color, not the medulla. Even if the medulla is dark, that's not what gives the hair its color. It's the cortex. And so like when people dye their hair, what they do is, you know, you first have to put in some kind of harsh treatment because what it does is it breaks, puts little holes into the cuticle so that way the dye can get inside the cortex. Then you put that fixer, the relaxant in there, and it causes the hair then to relax and the cuticle will then close back up and the dye is stuck inside the cortex. That's how you dye your hair. But the normal coloring of your hair also comes from that cortex. So we have pigments in there. And as you age, of course, then you lose the ability to make those pigments and that's why your hair turns gray or white. Um, it's also, if you prematurely gray, it can be a sign, by the way, of heart problems. <clears throat> and so now you're probably going to be looking in the mirrors, like looking for this little gray. But like I had an uncle who actually ended up dying, had a massive heart attack, never had any known heart problems before. It was more my grandparents started on riding one mower, just fell over dead. He was dead by the time he hit the ground. But he was completely white-headed by the age of 25. So he was dead at the age of around 40. Yeah, and he was really healthy otherwise. He ran, he was very active. But... It's not, just because you have premature gray doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have heart problems. It's just one possibility because of the mitochondrial damage. Okay, but once again, it's the cortex. It's this cortex that has the, gives the hair its color. The cuticle is the outer covering. It's like the sheath. It gives the hair the strength. And then we're going to see the medulla. With the medulla, there are different patterns that medulla can have. And um, that can help give an idea on the species and also to be used as a point of comparison from, from different species and different individuals sometimes. Okay, so these are just the words of what I've been saying. The cuticle, it is scalar, like it does look like it has scales. We're gonna go over some of the different patterns in just a moment. And it's very, very useful for being able to tell the difference in species. Because I've got pictures here and you'll be able to tell, like they are a cat hair, the cuticle for a cat hair looks very different than a human's hair. And so we have various hairs from various animals that we can look at in lab. And we also have different types of human hair that we can look at in lab as well later on today. Now one thing is by looking at the cuticle, even if you only get a hair, a little piece of the hair, like not the full hair, you can tell what direction the hair was growing because the scales always point towards the tip. So that's one interesting thing is you can always tell because they will point towards the tip as it grows. So even if someone cuts their hair, they'll be able to tell one end from the other. So I do want you to know that, I mean, there's lots of subcategories, but I want you to be able to know and to explain the rationale behind coronal, petal, mosaic, and wave. And we're going to upload this up so that way we can see it a little bit better. What does the word coronal come from? What does it mean? Like, what's a corona? Beer. Yeah. But what's the, what's the symbol, I do believe, on the corona beer? Or if you speak some of the Latin-based languages, it's also similar to the word in Latin. It's a crown. Crown, yeah. And so they look like little crowns. So sometimes they look like there's that one. And once in a while you'll see ones that look more like I'm going to attempt to draw. It will look like this. Almost like a palm tree. <clears throat> that would be a coronal pattern. Okay, there are different types of petal 
patterns, and those are similar to petals like a, as on a flower. Okay, and so that's why this, well, that would be considered a petal pattern. <coughs> Didn't mean to write on that one. So this is a petal pattern. No, you just need to know the four basic ones I told you about and be able to rationalize between coronal, petal, mosaic, and wave. Okay. And so the wave patterns will look like waves. So that's the wave look. You can have different irregular versus regular waves, all that kind of stuff. Do we need to know subcategories? No, nope. just be able to explain the four broad basics. And if I gave you a hair, you could use and say, well, I think it's, you know, mosaic because of this or petal because of this coronal or wave. Okay. So chevrons, what do you think is, so since it's a sub, it is a subcategory, but a chevron, what is a chevron besides a gas station? <laughs> it's a what? They have a That's a <laughs> You know, to me, it always looks like, um, like the EKG, you know, the EKG thing. That's what that, it's, it's a type of wave. It's this little, <laughs> I, can't, I can't explain it either way. So it's a double chevron, a single chevron would just be a, a really big wave. Um, so, like if you were looking at, if I had given you this one on a quiz or an exam, I would expect you to say that's a wave, because it's clearly not a crown. It's not mosaic, which we'll talk about mosaic in this moment, and it doesn't look like a petal, so therefore it has to be a wave. <laughs> what is mosaic when we say a mosaic? You hear about mosaic as a mosaic pattern or something like that. Right, they're pieces that fit together, sort of like a jigsaw puzzle. And so that's why this one is called irregular because of the fact that these are irregular pieces, but they all fit together. Um, whereas if I gave you this one and you told me it was some type of mosaic, I, I could. As long as you explain the reason why, I can understand. <clears throat> uh, the difference between regular and regular, it's kind of hard, I mean, in the sense that the little, the pieces that come together from the mosaic here are more similar in size versus big dissimilarity. But once again, the mosaic is a mosaic. So if you look at this one, this is pectinate, which is a subcategory. But of the four major ones, what would you call this one? Would this one be a petal, coronal, wave, or mosaic? And so I would expect you to be, because you can make those, either of those arguments as long as you explain the reasons why. Which one would that be? I would have ex accepted either pedal or wave as long as you explain the reasons why. Because right. there is a wave action, but at the same time, you know, this does kind of look like, you know, a sunflower. Now let me move this up so we can see some more. So, I'm hoping that you can see. I didn't want to give away all the answers. Whereas, if we look at this one, what would this one be most likely? Pardon? Here, let me. This, this one right here, whoa. <laughs> this one right here is going to be a petal. Whereas, this is clearly a wave. I would take a wave for this one. That's a single chevron versus a double. And then this one <laughs> is, a, is a wave. It's a mess, but it's a wave. <clears throat> no, not that I know of. No, I think that's pretty much, it's usually species, species specific. And I've got examples from different animals and things like that coming up. Which you shouldn't, I mean, realize that if you, even within the same species, like two different dogs, you know, some dogs have really smooth hair, like almost like human hair, and then some of them have very coarse hair. And a lot of that's due to the, that's due to the cuticle. And also on the same body, you can have different types of hair. But that's true with our bodies, too. Body hair versus the hair on top of your head is very different. <clears throat> okay, so this one, I'm going to actually turn all the lights off so you can see some of the patterns better. This one is from a deer. Okay, so that's the cuticle. A lot of times, 
way that you can see, it's kind of hard to see the cuticle and to differentiate it from the medulla, which I'll show you what the medulla and the cortex look like in just a moment. But what they've done sometimes is I'll take a hair and I'll put something like almost like a jelly or a glue and they will like leave a little finger, it's not a fingerprint, it's a hair print where they'll dip the hair in it and they'll carefully remove the hair and that leaves behind the cast, you know, the mold. And so then you can clearly see the cuticle and not have to worry about anything else. And so I'm not sure if this is the actual cast made from it, but, um, or if it's the hair itself. So what kind of, of the four big ones, mosaic, wave, petal, and coronal, what kind do you think is this one is most like? I would say probably the petal, but now if you explain the mosaics, quite possibly, this is clearly not coronal or wave, like if you said that, that would could really be wrong, but yeah, it's very petal-like, okay, or if you'd explain like how you thought it was a mosaic, I can understand that, but that's a deer. This one, I forgot to write down what it was, um, <laughs> but this one's a different animal. And so what kind of cuticle is it? Pardon? I would say this one's probably more mosaic. One of these was from a skunk. Maybe I can do it right now. Um, what about this one? Wave. This one's clearly a wave. Kind of looks like a zebra almost. It's not. This is not zebra here though. But, <laughs> but yeah, this one's clearly a wave. What about this? Yeah, this one looks like a mosaic or some type of really irregular wave, maybe. But yeah. Here we go. This one's very much coronal. These are two different cats. Okay. Now, what they've done is it's false coloring just so that we can see the, just to let you, you know, know that this is, the cat clearly was not colored like this. Um, but what about all this other stuff that's dander. stuck in there? Yeah, it's going to be dander or dirt. Could even be, you know, insects or something like that. But yeah, there's dander and dirt and oils and other things, other stuff that you can see many times with the microscope. <clears throat> yeah, this cat definitely could use a good bath. Okay, so those were the the cuticles. Now I want to talk about the cortex, and that's the bulk, the main body portion of the hair shaft. Okay, and its major implication or importance is the fact that that's where the pigment is. So that's why once again, gives the hair its normal color. And it's the distribution, the shape of these that you can use for comparison between different individuals. So yes, maybe two of them are red hairs, but the pigmentation is distributed differently between one hair and another hair to make it either consistent or inconsistent with you know, the suspect or the victim or what have you. And we've already talked, you know, that you could use the cuticle to say, okay, this is clearly not a human hair. This is a cat hair or a dog hair, <clears throat> which I used to have some examples of hairs from my dogs that I had brought in, but I think the previous years have lost them since. And this is the medulla, and it's like a column that runs through that center part but not every hair has medulla. And that, whenever it's not there, it's called absent, an absent medulla. And there is a formula, it's a very, 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 very simple formula that I do want you to know. It's called the medullary index, and I've got it written out in a moment. But it's just like what percentage or what fraction of the hair, the diameter of the hair is made up of medulla. For some people and animals, it's either gone or it's very tiny. For others, it's almost the entire shaft. Okay, so usually for humans, we're talking about a very small amount, if any. Okay, whereas some animals, it's almost the entire diameter that's the medulla. 
And there are different med medullary patterns too. But the four that I want you to know are continuous. Which what do you suppose a continuous medulla looks like? It's, yes, yeah, it's a straight line. There's interrupted, which means it would be a straight line, but it's broken in a couple places. And I've got pictures in a moment. There's fragmented, which means it's broken repeatedly, like it's been fragmented. And then there's absent, which means it's, it's not there at all. And this can vary from person to person, from hair to hair, parts of a body, all this kind of thing. And some of the, especially some of the animal medulla, or and the plural for medulla is medulla. Um, but some animals have really cool ones. They look kind of like pearls or bubbles and things like that. But human medulla is, it's not very pretty. It's just, it's a streak. <clears throat> so here we go. All right, so this would be the medulla, and would you suppose that this one is going to be continuous, absent, fragmented, or interrupted? That one's continuous. What about in this hair? Absent, and then this one? I would take either one, because it's kind of hard to tell, because it's a little broken here, and it's definitely broken there, so fragmented makes the most sense, but if you had more of the hair, to where you could see that these were the only two bro uh, breaks, essentially, then, be, then it could be interrupted. And that probably will not let me click through. Um, let's see. I don't know if that... Let me just check real quick. Now, I've also included not only where they come from, but their magnification. So, for example, the rabbit has been magnified 250 times. Whereas the human has only been magnified 70. Okay, so this, on the rabbit, you can see it's got a very distinctive patterning for the medulla. It kind of looks like little ladders or little tracks or something. Whereas on the human, what kind of medulla do you suppose that this, this hair, let me hear, let me just write in. Right there, it's showing. This one's fragmented. I mean, there's just little bits and pieces here and there. Whereas the other three, at least in the view that we see, you don't see any medulla, so they would be absent. Okay. So this is the skunk, both the dark and the white hairs. And it's kind of hard to tell, but they almost look like little pearls or something, little jewels in the white portion. And then the black hair, the dark hair, it, it's more of a ladder-like. This is a tiger. Okay. First off, this one's really cool because we can clearly see all three parts, the cuticle, the cortex, and the medulla. Okay. So, first off, let's just look at the cuticle. What kind of cuticle pattern is that? It's coronal. Almost like a little stack of cups or something. Right? And then we can see the cuticle itself, which is all this other stuff that's on the inside. And then we have the medulla. What kind of medulla would this one be? This one's a continuous medulla. This is a mouse hair. So it's got a very distinctive pattern for its medulla versus the human. And so the medullary index for a mouse is quite high. Because the way that you do determine the medullary index is you literally measure just the diameter of the medulla divided by the total diameter. That's why I say it's really simple. And this one would be almost one. because it almost takes up the entire length. Whereas the human one that we've seen in the past, if it's there, it's really tiny. Here's the squirrel. First of all, this one right here, that's just a bubble. <laughs> but that's the squirrel's medulla. I like the, the cat of unknown origins. 
but it's definitely got a fragmented or interrupted medulla on this one. So yeah, the medullary index is the diameter of the medulla, and you just divide it by the diameter of the entire hair. So it's always going to be less than or equal to one. And for humans, it's usually less than one-third, if it's even there. If obviously, if it's absent, then the medullary index would be zero, because zero divided by anything is zero. Some of the animals, like the mouse one that we just saw, it's really, really high. It's almost one. Okay, and so that's another way you can kind of get an idea of whether or not the hair is of human origin or of another species, which that could still be circumstantial evidence. For example, if you found hair is consistent with my dogs at a crime scene, then it could be used circumstantially as transference from myself to that crime scene. Okay, are there any questions on the parts? And one thing that, let me just go. Okay, and so the root is the part of the hair that's inside the follicle itself, and it has everything there for the hair to grow, okay, for you to be healthy. Now, I'm sure that there have been times that you've been brushing your hair or combing your hair, or maybe you've gotten a fight or had some that ripped out, and it'd be that little white portion that's on the very end kind of white and clear, it's not dandruff, but what it is, is that's called the follicular tag, and that's very, very important. The follicular tag is the part that will have your nuclear DNA in it. Okay, remember, what's so special about nuclear DNA? Um, it's, it's, for that one person. it's specific for that one person. Whereas, if it doesn't have that follicular tag, the, it's hard to get any DNA from the hair, but the only DNA you'll be able to get from the hair is some mitochondrial. You've got to have that follicular tag. That's the reason why whenever they're doing a perk kit for sexual assault, and I know it sounds horrible, but they're going to rip the pubic hairs and the head hairs right out of both of the victim and any suspects because they're deliberately trying to get the follicular tag. Okay, So they can't cut it because if you cut it, you're not going to get it, obviously. So they'll just take tweezers, forceps, and they'll rip it out. Okay, and So that's the way you can individualize the hair. By looking at the morphology, the structure, the shape, you can't. You can say it's consistent or inconsistent with it. Or you may be able to get mitochondrial DNA. However, as we know, that will only link it to a certain maternal bloodline and not an individual. And so what we're going to be doing in lab today is actually using a microscope. Now, we, we have just the a traditional microscope. We don't have a comparison microscope. But the comparison microscope is similar to what um, you do with that ballistics. So if you go ahead and you take that ballistics test, not test, but assignment um, quiz online, which I looked at it just, well, since I was homesick, I went online and I was able to, to look through it and get it to work. And so if you go through and get that to work, you're going to be using a virtual online electronic comparison microscope. They do the same thing with the hairs. Just like you match the, the lands and the grooves on a bullet, you're going to try to match up medulla, the cuticles, things like that, on, between the hairs to see if they're consistent with it for visual inspection. Okay, so when it says scale structure here, we're talking about the, the cuticle portion, the medullary index, the shape, the medulla, things like that. There's the medullary index. Okay, and once again, this is the diameter of the medulla divided by the diameter of the hair shaft. It's always going to be one or less than one. And once again, for humans, it's around 0.3 or less. Some of the animals, it's almost one because it takes up almost the entire length of the, uh, not length, the entire diameter of the hair. Okay. Now, the problem with hair, and this is a big limitation, is that it can, even though you're looking at it microscopically, and they like to show pictures, it can be very subjective, right? Because your base, first of all, you've got to find hairs that are very similar to each other. <laughs> and secondly, you're just going to be basing it off of the scientist's you know, viewpoint of, okay, yes, I found a hair 
that's missing the medulla, and there's also hair of similar color, and cuticle is missing in the medulla at the same, you know, on the, on the crime, at the crime scene. And so, once again, it's kind of subjective. So it can't, it should not be used, I should say, as the sole piece of evidence um, to try to convict somebody. It can be circumstantial evidence and say it's consistent with it to help link him or her to the crime scene. But unless you have that follicular tag, it shouldn't be used to individualize that. Are there any questions so far? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'll... Okay. So some of the things and questions when you're wanting to compare hairs, whether it's from a crime scene and like to a suspect or, or victim, is first of all, you want to know, like, is it possible <clears throat> to tell what body area from which the hair originated? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And so, because they're different parts of the body is going to have different consistency of hair. The hair on your arms and your legs is going to look a lot different than the hair on your head. And even with men, the hair from their face is going to be different than that from the hair on their head, okay? What about the racial origin of hair? Is there a difference between different ethnicities? Yes, okay? So Asian hair is going to be different than Native American hair. It's going to be different than those that are of African American or African descent. What about the age or the sex of an individual? Is it Can you tell gender between in the hair? No. no. And you can't tell age <clears throat> except for one exception. Does anyone know what the one exception is that sometimes you can tell? Pardon? Right. There are the absence of No. It's infants. Infants have downy hair. <laughs> Like whenever they're first born and everything, it's real, real soft and it's different. But then as you age, it's, it's all pretty much the same. Because as we heard on Wednesday, some of us got gray hair at young ages. <laughs> I don't mention any names. Um, no. So, and is it possible to tell if a hair was forcibly removed from the body? Yes. You can sometimes. Okay, because if it's pulled out, sometimes there's going to be blood or tissue. Now, remember that's called the follicular tag. It makes it more likely that it was ripped out forcibly. And there are efforts being made to individualize human hair, but they haven't been fruitful so far. And then, what about DNA? Can DNA individualize the human hair? <clears throat> yes and no. In the sense that it depends on what part of the hair it came from. Remember, it's from the shaft, the body portion of the hair, it's going to be just mitochondrial DNA. Whereas if you can get it from the follicular tag, then it can be the nuclear. That's where the nuclear DNA will be at, be at for the hair. Okay. So this, this is the picture showing the different phases. And I do want you to know the phases. Because this also just explains like normal hair and what happens like for whenever men go bald. Or even women going bald. So, the very first phase is called anagen. Okay, so that's whenever the hair is growing and it grows fast. And so, there are parts of our body where the hair is in the anagen phase for really long periods of time. What's one part of your body where the hair is pretty much almost always in an phase? It's the hair on your head. Okay, for most people. Then what happens is catagen comes next, and so this spells at, A-C-T, okay? So catagen is next, and that's where the bulb, the roots of the hair start to dry up. They shrivel a little bit, okay? There's still nutrients, some nutrients can still get to it. It's just more difficult. This is the capillary, it's supplying blood and nutrients to the hair. But starting, it's starting to shrivel up and die so to speak. Then it rests, which is telogen. Telo usually means around the end. Like the telomere is called the end, of, the end of your DNA is called the telomere. So this is telogen. And so it's in the resting phase. And there are some of your hairs that are predominantly in telogen. Okay, and so some of those are like, a lot of the times the hair on your arms, you know, it, it, they don't really seem to grow unless you shave them. Um, so, unless it's being shaved or something like that, it usually will stay principally in catagen and telogen. 
Wait, so if you like, if you never cut your hair, you only grow to a certain point? Well, the hair, it depends on what part of your body. I mean, on your head, or is it always here? Mm. No, it can grow really, really, really long, like, you know, to the floor and beyond. But it will start to, you know, to die, the ends of it. I mean, obviously, you won't be able to get the nutrients. So that's where you get split ends and it starts to look fried, things like that. Then what happens is at the end of telogen, the new hair, if it's, if, if you're, as long as you're not going bald, the new hair actually will start to grow and it pushes the old hair out. So that's why your hair will naturally fall out. Okay. Now at this phase, sometimes you can pull the hairs out because if they're not held in place very well in the follicle, they'll just come out on their own. And so what happens if you have like male pattern baldness and stuff is that you don't get this growth phase and the new hair doesn't grow. And so whenever it gets to this point and it falls out, there's nothing that grows back in. So is it possible for women to have male pattern baldness? It is possible. Okay, so there, that's the reason that, that women's hair can go bald. And the reason why it's called male pattern baldness, why is it called male pattern baldness? That's correct, but why do males have it usually, not females? What chromosome is it on? It's not stress. I would say uh, many women would probably argue with you over the whole idea. It is not on the Y. It's on the X chromosome. And so, that's the reason why a lot of these, I'm going to do another Punnett square for just males and females, but <clears throat> that's the reason why there are a lot of diseases that are called X-linked, because men only have one X chromosome, but women have two. So let's say, for example, that you've got a bald man. So I'm just going to, he's got the, the bald gene on his X chromosome. So he's bald, but his wife is not. And so, he's going to have a daughter who's a carrier, possibly. Well, he's definitely going to have a daughter who's a carrier. But both of his sons will have full heads of hair. Okay? Now, let's say one of his daughters, let's say that she goes and she marries a man with a full head of hair. You get the X from the mother and X from the father and X from the father and XB from the mother. X and a Y and of course XB and a Y. So what that means is half of the male children that she has, 50% of the male children, would be bald. Or you have a half of a chance of becoming bald. Whereas half of the female children would be a carrier. And so now what happens is, let's say a bald man, if he married a woman whose father was bald, and so what happens is then this would happen, there's from the father, the mother, father, mother, father and mother. So if it's a bald man who marries a woman whose father is biological father is bald, then half of the females that they have will also have no kind of baldness. Okay? And so the other half will be a carrier. Half of the male children will be bald and the other half will be fine. What's the purpose of hair being on our head? Pardon? What's the purpose of hair being on our head? Like, what does anyone know? Why why do you have for heat? It's for heat. Protection. It's, it's for your body heat. The part of your body that loses heat the fastest is your head. And so, yep. <coughs> okay, but yeah, that's the reason why. And so that's why you've seen some of these women as they get older, usually they tend to lose their hair up in the front for male pattern baldness. Sometimes they get a thinning in the back. How does that, that uh, like product where you can grow your hair, how does that work? Well, it depends on what, what product you're talking about. But some of them, what they do is it tries to help create the growth and create what, you know, antigen phase, to recreate the antigen phase in your hair. But usually you have to have it, you, you're on it for life. Because once you start, stop taking it, then it's going to revert back. It doesn't change you genetically. Okay? 
And it's not going to work for everybody. And women definitely shouldn't, unless a doctor tells you to take it, women shouldn't take it because it can also cause, some of those medications will actually cause birth defects. So, uh, whereas a hair transplant, what they literally do is they transplant a healthy follicle system. And, of course, if you shave it, then you can lose that. And... So then, like I had an uncle who was bald, and he went in and got a hair transplant put in. But then one of my one of his daughters had got cancer, and so she lost all of her hair. And so he went and shaved his head so that way, when she was she was relatively young. That way she wasn't the only bald one in the family, and he never went and had it replaced. So, okay. But yeah, that, there there is a good chance. So ladies, if you have a bald dad and your mom's biological father is bald. You got a 50-50 chance later in life to start losing your hair. All right. So this is just another picture, I'm trying to show you at a different angle. So we have the antigen. You've got the catagen where it starts to shrivel up. So there's now more of a space between the capillary and the hair itself. And then you've got the telogen phase, which is where it's rusting. You're going to get a new hair that's going to start to grow out for this to come out. And this, by the way, is called a club hair because the end of it no longer has that follicular tag. It just kind of, it's like a, you know, it's kind of like a little ball, a little hard club. All right, so as I mentioned before, the mitochondrial DNA usually comes from the hair shaft. But once again, it's only going to limit it to a maternal bloodline, whereas the follicular tag is what's going to contain the nuclear DNA. And then, as I mentioned in the previous and last chapter, they usually try, it, it may depend upon the, what, what law agency, law enforcement agency that you work with, but usually they try to do like 50, 25 or 50 full length pairs that they pull out in order to try to get a good sample and to get some of the follicular tags along with it. Okay. <clears throat> All right. No, so when it comes to fibers, I don't want you to worry about a lot of the nitty-gritty details. I'm really wanting you to know about the broad classes. So there are two main classes, okay? And those are, the first one, or one of them, I should say, is, are the natural fibers, Fibers, okay. Whereas the second one, if it's not natural, it's going to be man-made or artificial or synthetic. Some people just say synthetic. Uh, but then we have the man-mades. <clears throat> and I want you to know examples of each, okay. <coughs> So the natural fibers, wool is the big one, and cotton. Okay, of course fur, cashmere, mohair, which was from a goat. Um, but those are the, the biggest ones that we see. You know, here in the U.S., material would be wool and cotton. Whereas man-made, the big one's gonna be polyester or nylon. And so man-made means that you, we've had to synthesize it chemically, whereas the natural ones means it comes from directly from a natural source. Okay. Now, what they're going to do is the way that they, you can microscopically tell the difference between wool and cotton and things like that. And if you have a blend, you know, that's important. You can compare like an 85-15% blend or something like that. <clears throat> But when it comes from synthetic ones, what they're going to look at is called the polymers. What are the repeating structures made up of that make it that synthetic? And so a polyester is made up of esters. So polymer just means the repeating unit. And your book goes into really great detail off of all the different types, like what it looks like for nylon versus 
you know, nitriles or polyester that's in acrylics and all this. I just want you to know an example. Like, or if I said, you know, polyester, that's going to be man-made. Okay, or if I said a polyacrylic, that's going to be man-made. So would silk be natural? Well, polyester is not natural. No, it's silk. silk. Oh, silk, definitely. Because mm -hmm. it's made by a caterpillar. Well, it's a worm or whatever. I'm not a, a biologist in that sense, so to me, it's, they're all bugs. <laughs> but yeah, it's made by the silk worm. <clears throat> See. Now, it's difficult many times to match fibers up, once again, so you can try to match up the identity of the fiber, like, you know, this is cotton and cotton, or it's an 85, 15% blend, you know, 85% polyester, 15% cotton. You can look at the color, and then you can also look at some of the chemical, if it's synthetic, you can look at the synthetic, the chemical properties, like what is the monomer? There are different types of polyesters. There are different types of, you know, polyacrylics and things like that. Okay? Another way is you can try to match if it's ripped from each other, match up the pieces. Or there are certain types that are just routinely used, especially like the kind of carpet fibers that are used in automotives. Um, you may have heard like tri -lobal, and it's where if you cut it in a suction, like with a guillotine or something like that, and you look at it, it'll look like it's triangular in shape, it's not circular. And so sometimes you can kind of match it up that way, but once again, it's very difficult to make it an individualistic characteristic. Okay, so many times you just have to limit it. So they'll say, okay, that kind of fiber matches, you know, a GMC, you know, uh, I can't think of the type of GMC now. <laughs> Right, GMC Sierras or GMC Terrain, like what I have, something like that. They can kind of narrow it down, but they can't say, okay, it came directly from Dr. Daystorm's GMC <laughs> Terrain. So, again, all right. And that's that. I really think that that's going to be all that I want to, which that's awesome, ends right on time. It's going to be, uh, I'm going to cover for.